he realised the unusual noise could be put to a good purpose. He adopted the sound for a whistle he was making for the Metropolitan Police, and the note proved so distinctive <coughs> that it was soon taken up by police forces all over Britain. Sherlock Holmes solved his first case, a study in Scarlet, in 1887 with a combination of guile, science and pure reason. Eliminate the other factors and the one that remains must be the truth. He was the archetypal Victorian detective, armed of course with a, a magnifying glass, the deerstalker and accompanied by his faithful Dr Watson. Drive on! Yep. Yep. The Victorians were fascinated by crime, and Sherlock Holmes fed an insatiable appetite for the excitement of the criminal underworld. Across Britain, huge numbers of people had migrated to towns and cities. This crowding together of strangers led to feelings of distrust and insecurity. And just as today, public fears were stoked with sensational reports of the most lurid crimes. The Victorians began to feel that they were being swamped by a crime wave. There seemed to be an increase in lawlessness in towns and cities right across the country. Crime was becoming a political issue and action was needed. In 1829, Sir Robert Peel introduced bobbies or peelers to London. And in 1839, the Birmingham force appeared. But it wasn't until 1856 that the government decided that every town in the country should have its own police force. For the police to be effective, they had to be recognisable by the public. So they wore a distinctive uniform. The early uniform started off with a top hat like that. Great. I like that. That's for the air of authority. Right. You're the boss, you're telling the people what to do. Okay. Don't park that wagon there. But the jacket is a tail jacket. Now the idea was that people in authority would wear the top hat, so they were giving the orders. But the tail jacket is like a servant's jacket for servitude. The public were paying us our wages, but we were telling them what to do. So they are the masters and we are the servants. Quite a tricky relationship. It's a very unusual relationship. Mm. Now, it's a nice jacket, but it doesn't seem to have any pockets. No need for pockets at all. We didn't start having pocketbooks till the 1890s. Mm. But what about evidence? You, you, the prisoners were dealt with the next day. There was none of this giving them bail and going on remand. They'd do a runner and go to another town. Right. Statement taking didn't come in really till the late 1880s. Gosh. And then what's on us this? Now this is your cutlass. That's you a wear that at fruit, all times. It? Oh, that's a vicious weapon, isn't it? I wouldn't like to be on the receiving end of that. Policemen had to be trained in cutlass drill right. before they were allowed out on the streets. The police could stop crime as it happened, but only if they were in the right place at the right time. All too often they weren't. For some notorious criminals, it was all too easy to escape the long arm of the law. In 1888, these streets in London's East End were the hunting ground of one of Britain's most notorious criminals the fearsome Leather Apron, more commonly known as Jack the Ripper. His crimes were cold and calculated. He cut the throats of five women, all of whom had fallen into disrepute. The first two and the last two had their bodies horribly mutilated, but on the third occasion he was almost caught in the act. He escaped, and within the hour, he killed his fourth victim. The Victorians were already terrified about crime, and these murders really touched a raw nerve. 
The Queen wrote to the Home Secretary expressing her severe concern and the people were desperate to find out about the murders. The newspapers were only too happy to print all the salacious details because their circulation was going up. In fact, some people said that journalists planted false evidence just to keep the story on the boil. The police came in for a lot of criticism for their handling of the case. They put out extra patrols and stakeouts in the streets, and they tried entirely new techniques. They got bloodhounds in. It was the first time they'd ever been used to try and track down the criminal. And while the bloodhounds were in London, there was no murder, and the police decided they were too expensive to feed and send them home. Come on, come on, dogs. And then the ripper started again. There were plenty of suspects, but the Ripper was never caught. In a murder investigation today, the police would unleash a whole battery of techniques that were simply unavailable to the Victorians. Nevertheless, the Victorians were the fathers of forensic science. The first forensic test was developed in 1840 to detect arsenic. Arsenic was a popular poison in the 19th century. It was sometimes known as inheritance powder because poisoners could easily bump off their relatives without leaving incriminating evidence. In 1832, a chemist called James Marsh testified at the trial of a poisoner. Marsh knew John Bodle had used arsenic, but he couldn't present convincing evidence in court and the guilty Bodle went free. Before Marsh, there was an extremely simple test for arsenic. All you had to do was to pass hydrogen sulfide through the suspect solution, and what you obtained was a yellow precipitate if arsenic was present. The problem with this was that if you left it for a few hours, the solution would basically go colorless, and you had no precipitate left. And therefore, this was useless for presenting to a jury. Angered by Bodle's later admission of guilt, Marsh developed the first test for arsenic that would stand up in court. You take a sample, in this case wine, laced with a few grams of poison, and heat it with acid and zinc. The arsenic in the wine can be revealed by heating the gas that comes off. The poison produces a stable, silvery metallic deposit. And this is the clincher. We have a thin layer of metal on our porcelain dish. This proves that there was arsenic in the wine. And this became the poisoner's downfall. The Marsh test was still used until the 1970s. And it wasn't the only Victorian crime-busting invention to stand the test of time. Photography was a giant leap forward. For the first time, they had accurate descriptions of the rogues. In fact, it was the introduction of the rogues gallery. Before Victorian times, prisons were more like dens of iniquity than houses of correction. After a visit to Newgate Jail in 1836, inspectors reported shocking findings. They'd seen a body of criminals of every class engaged in riot, debauchery and gaming. Newgate wasn't unique. Most prisoners had access to gin shops and prostitutes. In fact, your life as a prisoner depended on how rich you were because you had to pay the jailers. So if you had lots of money, you got better conditions. In fact, if you could afford it, you could live in the governor's house. You could even pay for somebody else to serve your sentence for you. The inspector's report horrified Parliament and the nation. Regardless of expense, a new penal system had to be developed. A system dedicated to moral regeneration. In the early 1840s, the Victorians built new prisons of an unprecedented size, like this one in Leeds. Behind the traditional facade hides a state-of-the-art Victorian building, designed to keep large numbers of prisoners segregated and under constant view. If you look above um, from where we stood now, um, it's, built, it's like looking on a bicycle wheel and the four wings are going off from the hub. You've got control of the environment on each wing. Uh, so if there's any, uh, for example, an incident on one wing, the person in charge of the prison can see what's going on and direct staff to that area. No blind spots, for example. It's an overall view of what's going on in the prison at that time. 
The accommodation wings were built to house hundreds of prisoners, each locked in his own cell. The cell itself is physically the same as it was um, a long while ago. And interestingly enough, in this establishment, several prisoners prefer to be on this side of the prison and, and in a cell like this than they would to a cell that were built about 10 years ago. Victorian prisons were built to enforce a new penal system. For prisoners, it was out with gambling and women and in with punishment and retribution, a regime known as solitude and servitude. Victorian prisons were crowded, but for the prisoner, solitude meant isolation. They weren't allowed to speak to one another, and they had to wear these scotch caps, pulled low down so they weren't recognisable. The only form of identification was a number on the otherwise anonymous prison uniform. Servitude meant hard work. And the prisoners had a huge range of ludicrous tasks to perform, like this one, the crank. It was completely pointless, and yet they had to turn this 10,000 times a day. That's 1,200 an hour, once every three seconds, at this speed, for eight hours solid. And it doesn't do anything, it merely clocks up the numbers. What's more, every now and then a warder would come along and tighten up the screw to make it more difficult to do and harder work. That's why they were called screws. Only 9,947 to go. With all the real dangers Victorians faced on the 